There is hope. It was in the dark days of apartheid in South Africa when Bishop Desmond Tutu spoke these words that he, for which he is well remembered. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. True. For multiple centuries of time, the nation of Israel had been clinging to the hope of the arrival of their promised Messiah, God's anointed Savior who'd rescue the nation from darkness and oppression, from suffering, and would bring that nation to the brightness of peace and prosperity. And just when that reminder was needed the most, God gave the prophet Isaiah a marvelous prophecy and a picture. And it's recorded in the 12th, excuse me, in the ninth chapter of Isaiah. So if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 9, if you will. It'll be on the screen as well. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in a chair nearby there. And if you don't have one, that's our gift to you. The book of Isaiah chapter 6 or 9 verse 6 here we go for a to us a child is born to us a child is born he begins to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father the prince of peace in this first series we're going to focus as we will in each each part of the message uh, of its series, we will focus on one of these four titles. Today, we begin with Wonderful Counselor. Well, that reminds us of names right off the bat. And, and when we think about it, I was thinking about it this week, quite often uh, names, depending on the culture uh, and the families, names quite often will reflect, uh, the names you choose will reflect something. For boys, it might reflect uh, their lineage. Uh, for those of you that may not know, I'll give you all the truth today. My name is Gary Hastings Beasley. A lot of people would not guess that second name. Well, my father's name was Kenneth Hastings Beasley. And one of my father's favorite uncles was Charles Hastings Beasley. We do that sometimes with our kids. We, we give them names that represent their lineage or their heritage. Uh, or perhaps sometimes we may give them a name that would perhaps speak of a temperament that we hope or a character that we hope would be manifested in that child one day. And quite often we'll turn to Bible names. Uh, perhaps for boys we might think of names like Joshua or David or, or Daniel or, or Samuel. Uh, we might think of those kinds of names, or, or Joseph. And for the gals, little girls, sometimes Bible names that we hope would be a characteristic of our child, we might choose the name Esther, or Sarah, or Rachel, or Mary. Some of those names would be very common. The actual name of Jesus is not given in the prophecy of Isaiah. He gives us titles. The actual name that would be given to Israel's Messiah would be, in the Hebrew, Yeshua, or in the English, Jesus. Now, when newborns are born, they not only have names, but sometimes they have, as Isaiah reminds us, titles. Titles. Uh, if they're an heir of royalty, and the title would proclaim the child's rule or the child's responsibilities. We all have a new king now as Canadians, and, and when he was born, he was given a title, and the title was His Royal Highness Prince Charles of Edinburgh. That was his first title. It wasn't too much long later that he was given another title, that he would be called His Royal Highness Charles, Prince of Wales. And then there were many more titles to come, but of course, the last and perhaps the greatest, His Majesty King Charles III, King of England, the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth, and by the way, the Defender of the Faith and Supreme Governor of the Church of England. For those of us in Canada, that would be the Engli Anglican Church. Mas Isaiah saw Messiah with these four titles, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So each of these messages is going to choose one, and today we're looking at there is hope, and that hope is focused on 
what comes to us in the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy as Jesus being the wonderful counselor. Wonderful is an adjective. We would imagine that and understand that. Wonderful, and it simply means full of wonder. Uh, I looked up for another, under, try to understand another t- meaning of the word wonderful, and this is what I found, and that is uh, s- extraordinarily marvelous. So Jesus would be the extraordinarily marvelous counselor. That's who he's. And Jesus would be true and faithful to his title. He was, he still is, and always will be full of wonder in his character and in his counselor, counsel. Later on, or perhaps earlier, I guess it was, Isaiah was told to describe the Messiah with these words. It's recorded in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Listen to these words, speaking about the wonderful counselor. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom. Wisdom is a primary ingredient to good counsel. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, or the fear of the Lord, which is at the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says, or the fear of or reverence for Yahweh, God. Any effective counselor must be one who offers counsel that's established in knowledge and, more importantly, in wisdom. Jesus is a wonderful counselor who offers both information, knowledge, understanding, and specifically wisdom. This baby would prove himself to be wonderfully marvelous in both of these issues. Knowledge, what is knowledge? Knowledge knowledge is simply what you know. It's the accumulation of facts. The fact is, the more you know, the more knowledge you have. And the more you know, the further you go. In the more you know, the further you go in. Jeopardy. Jeopardy. Don't you watch Jeopardy once in a while? <laughs> I I enjoy watching it every now and I just and I can come up with the answers occasionally, just not quick enough. Just not quick enough. What about knowledge? Knowledge is knowing what to do with what you know. Knowledge, or excuse me, wisdom. Did I say knowledge? Wisdom is knowing what to do with what you know. (laughs) And wisdom is very often drawn from experience. Is that not true? Uh, In an ideal world, in an ideal world, both knowledge and wisdom will grow with years something like men's ears. Uh, Ideal world, knowledge and wisdom will will grow with years. And because wisdom is closely closely attached to and closely connected to perspective, which really is vision, it's how we see things. And so because old people have seen a lot, we assume they must be wise. I have come to believe that wisdom turns your hair gray. (laughs) It's as simple as that. Wisdom turns your hair gray. (laughs) gray. The gospel writer Luke, he, he describes a very interesting incident that happened involving Jesus when he was just a youngster, just 12 years of age. For his parents, it was a heart stopping terror, time of terror, and for the temple scholars, it was a jaw-dropping time of, of shock and awe. It's recorded in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 47, and, and I would just want to read a little bit of this story for you. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Wow. So there's, what, four days have gone by now? Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, these panicked parents, that's not in there, but I assume that, went back to Jerusalem to look for him. 
Now, just let me pause for a moment. The Jewish historian Josephus, who lived in the first century, he wrote in his writings, in his history, and you can find it, that during the first century, there were as many as two million people that were in Jerusalem during the Passover. That's a lot of people. Finding one 12-year-old boy in a city that could have had as many as two million people. Verse 46. After three days they found him in the temple courts, probably the busiest place in the city, sitting among the teachers, a little boy among the gray hairs, listening to them and asking them questions. You know your questions reveal a lot about you. Simple people ask simple questions. Wise people ask questions that demand wisdom. Verse 47, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Let's just stop there and think about this for a moment. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding. Well, he was 12 years of age. Most of you will know that at 13 years of age, that's one year later, every Jewish boy would go through what they call bar mitzvah. And in Jesus' day, all of them did. And so, beginning probably at 12 years of age and before that, Jesus was already intensely studying in preparation for his bar mitzvah. And that would have meant studying the law studying the mitzvah, the commandments, so that one day he might be bar mitzvah, son of the law. Bar mitzvah, son of the law. But that's a year away yet. And here's a 12-year-old boy that's sitting among the scholars, the gray hairs, if you will, and he's asking them questions, and they can't get over it, not just his knowledge, but his understanding. Now, this is what just absolutely blows my mind. Read what the scripture says. I finished, just about finished with these words. Verse 46, they found him sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Now verse 47, remember it says, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his, not questions, his answers. I submit to you that he was asking them questions that they didn't have an answer to, and so he answered his own questions. They were amazed at his understanding, and they were amazed at his answers. He was asking the questions, and when they couldn't give him a good answer, he said, well, let me answer my own question. And he did. I want to tell you something. Jesus was, he is, and always will be, the wonderful counselor, the one who walked and spoke and counseled with a spirit of God-sent, God-given wisdom. When he was a young man, he spoke to packed synagogues. In Capernaum, the Bible tells us that the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not just like the teacher's did in the day. In the synagogue of the words of his childhood in Nazareth, the congregants said, where did this man get these things? How, how, did it, how is it possible? What is this wisdom that's been given to him, they said. And then the disciple, Apostle John, who walked with Jesus for, for three years, later on would write these words, declaring that Jesus was indeed not just the Son of God, but the Word of God. He, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So think about it for a moment. When Jesus spoke, he was not giving opinions about the Scriptures. He was, he was the living Scriptures explaining himself. 
Jesus wasn't just offering ideas of what the word might have meant. Jesus was the living word affirming what he meant. That's the authority that he manifested when he spoke. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Counsel given by any good counselor has to have a wealth of wisdom. But Jesus was not just any good counselor. He was the counselor that was full of wonder. He was the wonderful counselor. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, we read these words, In him, that's in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We read in the book of Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, The Lord grants wisdom from his mouth, come under knowledge and understanding. Now there's limitations to human wisdom. We know that human wisdom and knowledge and understanding has limitations compared to the greatness of the wisdom that's available from this wonderful counselor. I think it's well illustrated as, as a maybe comparing a map and a GPS. Sweetheart, I left my phone on, down there because I didn't think I'd need it. You know what? I'm going to need it just for this illustration. Some of you gray hairs are old enough what a, to remember what a map is. I never went anywhere without a map in my car. I'm blessed to have a pretty decent map in my brain. I don't usually get lost, but nevertheless, I always had a map in my car in case my wife was driving. Oh, dude. I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Not quite, but that was just too easy. That was set up so well I couldn't miss it. Throw me a softball and I'm going to hit it. Think about it for a moment. A map. They were printed, and the day they were printed, they became obsolete. Because changes were already happening. A map was an accumulation of facts. It showed you on a piece of paper the roads, the names of the streets, the names of this and that, and even some of the maps had topography lines on them, all those kinds of things that gave you supposedly what you needed to know to get from A to B. But try and compare that for a moment with what they have on these things or what you might have in your car, a GPS. A GPS is totally different. It communicates with the satellites that's up in the heavens looking down on us. And what you are getting is real-time information. And perhaps you might even have in, on your GPS in your car, it'll let you know if there's been an accident or a slowdown. Huck, you can't get those things from a map. If there's a detour, it might show you. All of that to simply say this. That true wisdom, true wisdom, is not wisdom just comes because we, we, we watch or read something. It comes because we're connected to something that's alive. God in Christ is our wonderful counselor because he has a perspective. He has vision to give wisdom that's out of practical, in the moment, information. Let me say it this way. You can write this down. I think they're going to have it on the screen. True wisdom. True wisdom. That's it. True wisdom. Issues from the heights of perspective to see what knowledge cannot. Can I say it again? True wisdom. Issues from the heights of perspective, sort of like a satellite, to let you see what knowledge cannot. Jesus was the wonderful counselor. And the words that he spoke, the wisdom that he gave, the understanding that he gave, changed a small group of young men called disciples who would then go and shake their world more than all of the armies of the Roman Empire. What Jesus spoke inspired apostles to write words that would be the very breath of God to become to us the Holy Scriptures. What Jesus spoke would have people build a living, growing, conquering, devil-defeating body of believers called the church that take the gospel around the world. The words that Jesus spoke have continued to give hope, strength, protection, confidence, to every true follower of Jesus Christ. He is the wonderful counselor. 
I've left myself enough time to tell you a story. Stay with me, if you will. It was 1994. I think it was just after Jan and I and our three boys actually visited Parkwood. There we had an opportunity to come, and our sons played their violins, and, and uh, we sang and ministered together for Pastor Mark. It was the fall of that year, 28 years ago, that Jan and I and our boys, who at that time, that was what our lifestyle, we were a traveling music ministry, and we traveled all over the U.S., and Canada, and even all over into Europe and down over into Africa as well. Fall of 1994, we were on our way to California. We'd been asked to come for a whole month to sing and speak at some churches in Southern California. The immediate destination on one of those days was Denver. We'd been traveling across the states. We had a large van. The five of us packed that thing to the roof, and we had our little dog with us, and we were on the road. And we were headed for Denver that day. We were traveling on I-76. I don't know if you know the map or not. But if you can imagine Denver, let's say Denver's like straight out there somewhere heading west. We were coming from the east, but we were on I-76, which is a little bit north. And it goes straight west, and then it drops down into Denver. By the way, there was another interstate, I-70, that was a little bit south, and we'd go straight west and then veer up into Denver. We were up on I-76, and we were traveling, and I listened to the radio, and I heard a report that there was a severe snowstorm coming directly at us. It already was close to Denver. With everything that we had for our lives, really, our children, my sweetheart, this was all we had that was important to us, sitting in a van heading towards a snowstorm. There was some fear there. And I was trying to figure out, what do I do? As I drove along 76 of the transports coming the other way and the ones around, ones around me, I began to think, I said, you know what? Maybe I can avoid this storm. If I, if I get off at one of these exits and just go straight south a little bit, uh, I could maybe get to a two-lane highway where I wouldn't have to worry about trucks. And, and maybe the storm would be easier, and I could just go along that. And, and there was a point later on where that highway would connect to I-70, and I would be able to get into Denver within an hour. I prayed, and I made a decision. I'm getting off the highway, getting off the, the grid in a way. I took the exit, went a few miles south, and I saw Route 36 that was headed west. I said, I'm going to take this. I have to tell you, I was asking the Lord desperately to give me some direction and some counsel here. So we started to go west, and I noticed that the, the indications were we had about 60 miles to go until we got to the interstate connection to I-70, and then we'd be close to Denver. 60 miles wasn't too far. But we hadn't traveled more than one or two miles all of a sudden, the front edge of that storm hit us. It was a whiteout. All of a sudden, I couldn't see anything except the blinding light of the snow coming against my windshield. By now, it's dark. And the darkness came quickly, and it was pitch black. I thought there was one little community that I remembered that was maybe about halfway. I was hoping, Lord, help me to make it to that small little town. I didn't know how small it would be. It turned out to be so small you would hardly notice it. We traveled and for the next period of time, it seemed like the world ceased to exist. We were surrounded by pitch black on all sides except the front that was so white. At times I had turned out my headlights so I could see better. Some of you have traveled in snow, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't make sense. But if there's just a little bit of moonlight you can see better than that driving snow that's coming directly into your face. And when I would do that, it was a little weird and a little scary, and I was praying that no other vehicles would come. I remember asking my boys, I had three sons, I said, two of you at the back windows, please. Stare, look out that back window, and don't take your eyes off what's behind us, because I want to know if you see any lights. That means something's coming up on us. And the other three, my wife, my youngest son, and I, we stared out the front. 
I came, became desperate, and I realized we were going to have to stop somewhere. We, we couldn't see the road anymore. We couldn't see signs. We couldn't see houses. There was no lights anywhere. I began to think maybe, maybe just any kind of, of gas station, any place I can just turn off. But I couldn't see where the road was to even turn. Inching along, I looked at my speedometer, and I, I'm going 15 miles an hour. I'm thinking, it's going to take me three hours or more to get to the, 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 the I interstate, but it seems to me there was a smaller place just maybe halfway. Maybe I can just get that far. Now, it doesn't matter if they don't have any hotel, motels. It doesn't matter if I can just find an empty lot, get this thing off the road where I'm safe. And my family and me, we can just rest in, in the car until the morning. It seemed like we were alone in the world. Not one time did another vehicle pass us. We traveled for about an hour and a half, and it seemed like an eternity. Nothing, could see nothing, did not go by one light. Nothing came in toward us or nothing from behind. And all of a sudden, in the darkness, I saw in the distance a light. At that point, I didn't care what it was. It was a light. I'd go where the light was and stop there. When I got close, I couldn't believe it. It was a motel. It was a motel. And not only was there a motel there, there was a restaurant. And there were cars filling the parking lot. I thought, i got to stop here. Oh, it would be wonderful to have a place to stay. We pulled in. It's called the Longhorn Motel. <laughs> I pulled in. I told the family, Hon honey, just everybody stay here. I want to intimidate us all walking in on them. So I walked in the door. Well, I had to push the door open because it was jammed. It was a small room and it was full of men and perhaps some women waiting for motel rooms. And I could see there was not much hope. I opened the door, got myself inside enough to look and see. Down maybe eight or ten rows here at that distance, I saw a desk and a man standing behind the desk. And I was about to leave and I heard him say, Who just came in? I said, I did, sir. What do you want? I'm looking for a room. How many of you? Five. Oh, it's you. I've been waiting for you. And I looked at the other people in the room, and I'm going, oh, oh. <laughs> and you know, not one of them looked sideways at me. They all just said, this is what's supposed to happen. He said, I've got a room for five people, and I've been waiting for you. The room is not really in the hotel section. It's right upstairs here above me. I had a feeling it was where he lived. I'm not sure. And he saw the storm coming, perhaps, and he put another double bed in there and a single bed, and there was a washroom and small little space, and he prepared it. We walked up those steps and felt like we'd, we'd arrived. It was late at night, so we settled down quickly and we found ourselves fast asleep. In the morning, I woke up and my boys were already awake, and I said, guys, just hang on a second. I turned to my sweetheart and I said, babe, I'm going to take the boys down and get something to eat and while I'm gone and you can get a chance to get up and do what you need to do to get ready and we'll bring some breakfast back. She said, honey, great idea. So I got the boys together and we didn't look all excited but all that good looking, but we went down the stairs and we stepped outside and the storm was done. The snow was piled up on top of, of uh, the uh, vehicles. And all of a sudden, I heard a noise. It was a noise of trucks. Trucks. And I looked around, and there, 
I couldn't see any trucks in the parking lot. But these trucks were moving, and they were moving fast. I thought, this is strange. And I looked, and I couldn't see anything. I looked around. I thought, where are these trucks? These are transports. Where are they? These 18-wheelers are trucking. Couldn't figure it out. Walked over to the little restaurant, went inside, asked for a seat, and the lady started to get us a seat. And I sat down, and I said to her, where are we? She said, you're at the exit for I-70 in a little town called Byers. How in the world did we get to Byers? My heart about stopped. I kid you not, in my years of life till, till now, I have never felt like I did in that moment. Such absolute shock to see how we could go a distance that would have demanded 60 miles an hour in an hour and a half to go that distance or, or less when I knew we were hardly crawling along at 15. How does that happen? All these years later, my three sons still remember, and I remember, my wife remembers, and we know, and we cannot be convinced otherwise, that on one dark night, on Route 36, headed towards Denver in the middle of a snowstorm, snowstorm where we should have been hunkered down somewhere, shouldn't have been traveling, God picked up a van. God picked up a van and he set it down. He told the man we were coming and he had a place for us. Yeah. Just to make sure that I wasn't getting it all wrong because things like that, I got a GPS out this week and I looked at all of the details where I was where we got off where we traveled that little thought, place we thought might be in the middle but it didn't exist all the way to the entrance to I-70 and we were within 45 minutes then of Denver impossible but remember I told you we were, it seemed like the world was away away from us. We were all by ourselves. We never passed another vehicle. We were just hunkered down, just looking at whiteness. God did something. Do you know what I did? I went back to see if I had any pictures. Did we have any pictures? Because that, that's not that long ago. Should I have pictures? You want to see them? All right, let's see what we've got here. On the left is... That's the motel where we stayed. Now, we were in the upper part of it. Uh, that, that's where everybody else stayed, but we were right at the front there. You can hardly see it just under the motel sign. To the right are our three sons and me. I know it's hard to tell which is which. <laughs> that was us getting ready to go over to the restaurant. At that point, we didn't know where we were yet. Go to the next slide. To the left is the hotel as it appears today. It's still there. I'd go and stay there maybe, but it's a two-star budget inn right now. <laughs> and that's the same sign that was above the whole motel that I took the morning after we were there. The Longhorn Motel and Restaurant. You know what? That seemed like a palace to us that night. And I look back today, and I say, God, whatever you provide, the counsel that you spoke to me when I was still back on 76 to get off, 
The counselor that just spoke to me and said, don't worry about it. Go on 36 and I'll get you there. The counselor that you spoke to the man when he prepared a room for us. All of that is because we serve a wonderful counselor who sees what we can't see. Who knows what we don't know. He knows our past. He knows our present. He knows our future. He knows where you are, where you've been, and where you're going. He is the wonderful counselor whose perspective is wider than we can imagine. He is the God who sees what we can't see. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.